Board of Finance meeting minutes. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that passes. Um, now we'll move on to presentation. County Treasurer, Madam Treasurer, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's good to see everybody. My name is Nancy Burse, and I'm County Treasurer of Bernalillo County. It's good to see you all. So today we're going to be reporting on the quarter ending December 31st of 2022. So that was our last quarter. And I point you to the report that we have in your packet. And there's your agenda on the second page outlining uh, where everything is on the pages. And the next page actually starts uh, looking at your property taxes. That's the quarter that we're very interested in uh, or involved in uh, collecting first half quarter taxes for 2022. So you see the three years there, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And uh, the net taxes that we were charged to collect, um, $815 million for this year. The taxes we collected during that first half, $460 million. And the taxes left to collect for second half, $355 million. Um, you will note that <clears throat> there's a big jump in that net taxes charged uh, from 757, 77, 7, sorry, uh, to this year at 815. And we were looking at that because that's one of the largest jumps we've had in the past 10 years tax roll. So when we looked at that, um, we really saw that net increase as really coming down to increased property values. Uh, our mill levy rates didn't go up that much. Uh, so it's really on the property value side that we had uh, a huge increase, um, more than we've seen, as I said, in, in the past 10-year tax roll. Uh, and when you think about that, think about what's happened in 21 and 22. We had a real estate market that just boomed. Uh, houses weren't even staying on the market for a day or two at very high values. Uh, and now we're starting to collect on those high value property taxes. So uh, that's what you see there. The next page talks about what is that tax collection rate. Uh, so we have the 10 years there. And on the 10 years, this is the first quarter that you'll see that earliest year drop off. So you saw 2012 drops off, so we can add 2022 at the bottom to make your 10-year 10 10 tax roll. Uh, so for uh, this year, again, 2022, it was collecting just over 50%, 56.43%. And um, that's relatively normal for us. Again, this is first half. You're not going to see 100% collections a little bit later in May or June. We'll have that for you. So there's your tax collection rate. Madam Chair. Commissioner Casado. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon. Good Madam afternoon, Treasurer. Commissioner and Madam uh, Chair. I just have a quick question on the, on, on, on the, the difference of uh, how the, the property uh, assessment went up. Uh, mm -hmm. do, do you buy, have a, uh, the information on, was that all of the area of Bernalillo County? Was it a specific area of Bernalillo County that, that property taxes went up, that values of properties went up? Uh, do you have that information? We you, do. We do not. So that would just come from the assessor's office, right? Well, it just comes from the values that we have on our tax bills. Mm -hmm. So there's no specific area where that 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 was that was countywide, or was it a, a specific area that their taxes went up? Madam Chair, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Casada, we did not slice and dice the data that way. We're glad to do that for you if you'd like, or if the commission would like that. We're glad to do that. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Please continue. Okay. So going back to page three, <clears throat> property tax collections, um, this is kind of your new slide. Uh, this is, we're trying to head towards a dashboard type of configuration. So uh, we put in uh, a lot of what we do operationally for those collections. So if we start at the top left, you look at your call volume. Before there were graphs that you saw, we're just putting these into little boxes now for you with pictures. So for the uh, quarter ending December 31st again, uh, we took over 10,000, almost 11,000 calls for that quarter. Uh, and that's very standard for first half. Uh, when we looked at each month, it was November that topped out at about 5,000 calls for that month. So uh, it, when uh, people do get their tax bill in the mail, they do tend to pick up the phone and call if they have any questions. Uh, speaking of tax bills, uh, there's your breakdown of how many were residential and how many were non-residential. And altogether, it was 276,987 tax bills that we sent out. And that is by far uh, the largest of any county in New Mexico, and that makes sense. We're the urban capital of the state uh, with the highest population and the highest properties. So that, that fits in perfectly. Below that is delinquent collections. Um, again, did a fantastic job, and I know my staff is here, um, with collections for that quarter, uh, topping out at just over $6 million for that quarter in delinquent accounts. And again, when people get their tax bill, it's on there if they have any delinquent taxes. And they start going, oh, oh I got to pay that. And uh, so we, we start collecting not only the delinquent taxes, but also the current rate. Uh, next slide is the uh, annual delinquent transfer to the state. Um, <clears throat> remember, I can only collect for up to three years delinquent, and then I turn it over to the state. The state starts their collections up to and including uh, delinquent tax auctions. So that is their bailiwick to do. And we were at 517. That's, again, an annual thing that we look at um, every July. Yeah, every July. So we'll see and take a look at it this July. It really has started to come down from COVID. Um, COVID, it jumped up to over 700. Uh, so that was not a good year. Uh, so we're starting to come down back to what's in our normal range. We did add the monthly payment plan. This is our 10-month payment plan. Those people that don't have a mortgage and aren't delinquent, usually they're on fixed incomes, uh, and it's better for them instead of paying two twice a year huge amounts, it's better for them to slice off 10 months each month, pay a little bit, and we break it out for them and tell them how to pay and even send coupons for them. So that's 4300 a uh, little bit over, 4328 uh, That's about standard. We've been running at that for quite a while, uh, but that's a program we love to tout, especially for our elderly that are on fixed incomes. Next is another new one, too. Uh, just talking about how do people pay their taxes. And that's important for us because we want to have the right operations, the right systems for that. So you can see there we break it out by the escrow and mortgage files that come in, <clears throat> as well as those that pay in person and or mail, and then the online payments. We're just now starting our third year of our new online payment system, so this really starts to give us a good, clear look at how, how are the systems working and where are people going, where are the customers going that we have to meet them at. So we'd like to show you that. And then how it all pans out after I collect it, we get to turn it back over to all those entities that I collected for, right? So um, here's the pie chart on how the property tax was distributed. So again, it's a very stable pie chart. None of these numbers actually changed uh, from last year. 
So we're still looking at 34% of our taxes go to educational institutions. That includes APS, the charter school, CNM. Uh, the next one <clears throat> is the county at 22%. We have cities and villages at 21%. So you think city of Albuquerque, village of Tejeres, Los Ranchos, um, they get 21% of our taxes. Then in the purple is health, UNM hospital. Uh, they average and they get 15% of our taxes. And that's just for a single entity is UNM hospital. The next one is the environment, it comprises a MAFCA, which is our flood control authority, um, the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. If you live on either side uh, of the river, you're in that conservancy district. And then we have Edgewood Soil and Water Con Conservancy District uh, in the East Mountains, and they total 4%. And the state in blue totals 4%. Um, we do get some questions about why do our taxes go to the state? Don't we already pay income tax? Well, we do. Um, but you recall that the tax, also, the state also takes out tax bonds. So uh, we had one just in the November ballot, actually. Uh, the state took out some bonds for veterans' homes and renovation and refurbishing of their veteran homes that the state has. And they have to pay back those bonds so they get some of our taxes as well. As we continue, I'm going to go, uh, we're looking at the safety of uh, where our money is, and I'm going to turn it over to my deputy treasurer, Ryan Travelstead. Great. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Uh, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Ryan Travelstead. I'm the Deputy Treasurer uh, with uh, Madam Treasurer Burse. Um, I'll go over the uh, bank balances that we have, the portfolio structure, and then transition that over to government portfolio advisors, the county's investment advisor, to go talk through some strategy um, for the coming quarter. So um, again, this is as of December 31st, just kind of looking back. This slide here details the bank balances and collateral associated with those bank balances. And, and what that means, um, so bank, bank accounts are collateralized up to, or uh, insured up to the FDIC limit. Regularly, our balances are in addition, are over the FDIC um, coverage. And so what we do is we enter into agreements with those banks to pledge collateral, uh, securities as collateral, so that in the event of a bank failure, the county obtains ownership of those securities to recoup our lost balances in the event this kind of a, a worst case, so to speak. So this slide here details that um, for each of the accounts that we have. Uh, we look at this regularly to make sure that the county taxpayers' funds are, are, are well managed. Um, so if you see here in the top left corner, Wells Fargo, uh, Bernalillo County, um, we had balances of around 31, almost $32 million, uh, $750,000 of FDIC coverage. Uh, which leaves an uninsured balance of $31 million. And then the collaterals uh, that the uh, Wells Fargo had pledged was $76.7 million, so more than enough uh, to cover that balance as of December 31st. Um, and again, this is just a snapshot, so these balances are changing regularly. The collateral that they're pledging is, is changing regularly as well. Um, the next slide down, the next uh, section down, we'll talk through the uh, Burnley County Affordable Housing Nonprofit. Um, this account has a $1.3 million balance at uh, December 31st. Um, this account, since it's structured under the, the Bernalillo County Affordable Housing Nonprofits tax ID number, the FDIC coverage is just a little bit different than the, the county's accounts. So this one only has $250,000 of FDIC coverage. Um, so that leaves an uninsured balance of $1.1 million. And again, the, the uh, Wells Fargo Bank had $1.2 million uh, pledged as collateral, so more than enough to cover those balances as well. Um, as we work our way through the, the other accounts, the Wells Fargo San Miguel County, the Bank of the West, um, those accounts are both below the FDIC insured amount, so those are the, the balances there. Um, Main Bank, that account is also fully FDIC insured. Um, you might ask why this $5 million has, a, or why this account has $5 million of FDIC coverage when the Wells Fargo account is capped at 750000 The reason is, is the, the type of deposit account um, this, that this is, is it essentially splits out that $5 million into $250,000 pieces in banks across the country so that each of those accounts um, with those banks across the country are fully FDIC insured. Um, and then the, finally we come into the uh, Bank of America accounts. Those are two 
uh, very old repurchase agreements, um, investments that were entered into, I believe, in the late 90s. Those were fixed rate investments. Um, they come due in 2027 or 2028, I believe. Um, but yeah, we, there's, they're very high yielding, and so there's no real reason to, um, to liquidate those. So again, those are collateralized. Um, there's no FDIC coverage on those accounts. There's uh, $10.8 million of collateral pledged on those two uh, repurchase agreements. Next, we'll come into a, a quick economic update, and I don't want to steal the, uh, the thunder from our investment advisors, government portfolio advisors. Um, yeah, they, ha they have a, a team that looks into this, uh, yeah, a lot more detailed, but generally here on uh, what we're seeing, um, there's still a lot of mixed signals, uh, mixed signs out there in the, uh, the economy. So uh, Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates to try to cool down inflation, somewhat been working, then we got some a little bit contrary data in January that wasn't quite what they were expecting. Um, got some really strong jobs numbers that came out in January, so it's really hard to say what's going to happen as ever. But I think now with the, with the uh, a lot of leading indicators with uh, economic data, they're they're hard, becoming harder to interpret. Um, generally, there's a, a I wouldn't say a consensus, but there's murmurs of a, a potential shallow recession in late 2023, and so we're uh, we're definitely keeping our eyes on that as we. Yeah, determine where to position the investment portfolios. Um, and a, a good uh, bright spot here with, with the New Mexico economy is that the preliminary data points that the, the uh, New Mexico jobs are only 1% below pre-pandemic levels, which is really great. Um, so yeah, then we'll also recognize that New Mexico generally lags the national economic trends. So what we're seeing on the national level, we might be ex expect to feel a little bit, maybe six months, maybe a year after that. So um, again, keeping a, a close eye on things that are happening on the, the national level here. And then the next slide here, I'll go over the structure of our investment portfolios. So we have this, this split out into four buckets, uh, a bond proceed bucket, um, Operating funds buckets, which is made up of the highly liquid and liquid. That liquid, sometimes you'll hear it referred to also as a cash match bucket. Um, and then we also have a core bucket. And so the, the distinction between these, these four buckets has to do with the how they're invested and the length of time that the underlying securities are invested. So the, uh, the we'll start with the bond proceeds on the, the farthest left. Um, this, this bucket is essentially managed to, to draw down schedules. So as the county issues debt to fund capital projects, say like road pavings or uh, constructing, build, constructing buildings, we will sell bonds, we'll receive those proceeds, and then we'll invest those proceeds until we get the invoices from contractors to pay those bills. So as we anticipate um, the contractors needing to be paid, then we'll, let those, we'll time the investments to mature uh, to correspond with that. Um, our highly liquid bucket, that's essentially as good as cash. It's, it can be turned over um, in less than 30 days. There's no withdrawal penalties, anything like that. So, um, yeah, very liquid, very usable to, to transfer to, to fund bills. Um, the liquid portfolio, what this, this portfolio does is we've, it's uh, essentially we have, we have uh, investment securities that we schedule to mature to coincide with the timing of the county's debt payments and payroll payments. So those are two very well-known um, at cash outflows. So if we know it and we have the money, then we'll buy an investment to mature at the same time that we'll need to distribute that funds, those funds so that we can earn some interest and then in turn use those interest funds to uh, provide further resources uh, for taxpayers. And then the uh, final bucket here is the core bucket. And this is essentially cash that we, will, we don't anticipate needing in the near term. So this, an example of this is the county's 312 DFA reserve. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, kind of rolled into that core bucket and invested out a little bit longer in the zero to five year space. Um, this next slide kind of goes over what I just talked about, but gives maybe a more high level of, you know, kind of why does the county have a, an investment program? So essentially it comes down to a timing difference between when money comes in and when money goes out. So again, we have inflows, regular inflows like our property tax collection cycles, gross receipts, taxes, and fees for services um, on the inflow side. And then on the outflow side, we'll pay vendors, payroll, debt payment, and then we distribute the property taxes uh, that Madam Treasurer mentioned um, out to those entities each month. So there's a, a timing delay there. And so if there's a timing delay there, then we can take off, uh, use that to our advantage to make some investments to earn some interest, interest income uh, to then provide more additional resources for, uh, for taxpayers. 
and this will detail over the portfolio balances as of December 31st. So in the operating bank account, we had 15.6 million. The highly liquid, which again is that less than 30 day maturity, made up about 12% of the total at 120 million. The uh, liquid had about 552 million. Um, and one thing to note here is the December 31st, um, there was property tax collections that occurred in the month of December. We don't send those to the tax distribution entities until January. So in that spread of time, we'll invest those in this liquid bucket to earn a little bit of investment income before we distribute it to the entities. So you'll see next quarter, it won't be quite as high as that 552. Um, we distributed, I believe it was $233 million to the tax collecting entities in the month of January. Um, and then we moved down to the core portfolio, 273 million, and then bond proceeds had 27 and a half million. And if you see in the farthest right column, the, the book yield on those investment portfolios, um, yeah, the highly liquid and liquid, those are a little bit shorter term, term portfolios. And as the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates from June of last year through current, those respond quite a bit faster to those increasing interest rates, which is why you'll see those a little bit higher than you will the core or the, uh, uh, the core portfolio. The next slide will detail the underlying holdings of each bucket um, and those maturity structure. So as you see here in the highly liquid page, um, all of the, uh, the securities are maturing less than 30 days. We have 60 million in a money market fund. Uh, 54 million in the local government investment pool with the state treasurer's office, um, and then that five million dollars there with Main Bank makes up the 120. The next slide down goes over the liquid detail, and you can see here how this is split out. We have five million dollars in a five and a half million dollars in a money market fund, uh, 45 million dollars um, in treasuries that mature less than 30 days, uh, 53 million dollars in commercial paper. Uh, $8 million in Fannie Mae, $150 million in Federal Home Loan Bank, and $98 million in Fed Farm Credit. Um, and as you can see, go down the line, we have $166.3 million that matures within 30 days in one year, and $26 and, and a quarter million dollars maturing less than two years. So very well positioned if we you know, have a, a, a need for cash to, to pay a vendor. If there's an unexpected expense, we have sufficient cash to, to cover those. And then the, finally, we'll go here on the, the core portfolio detail. Again, shows the, the structures of how those uh, each individual security, um, or how the portfolio is structured by security type and by um, duration or maturity period. And then finally, we'll go over the bond proceeds detail. So 6.6 .6 million there in uh, US treasuries that mature in less than 30 days. And then the final, the remaining 20.8 million that matures less than uh, one year. And again, this portfolio is structured to meet those anticipated uh, outflows to vendors and that are uh, performing capital projects for us. And again, just a, a final way, look at the a graphical representation of the, the uh, bond proceeds, core, and liquid bucket. So you see there's $376 million that, uh, as of December 31st, there was $376 million that was coming due less than 30 days, so more than sufficient liquidity um, and then we see as it tails down 250.6 million in the less than a year, 96.6 million between the one to two year, 57 and a half from two to three, and so forth. And finally, what this boils down to is it shows into the investment income that the county's investment portfolios are earning. So as of the December 31st, there was, uh, for the quarter ending December 31st, we had uh, $4.3 million in investment income that was earned. And so you can see that's a, a sizable jump from the prior year and also a sizable jump from the first quarter. And uh, so what this is, is um, since the Federal Reserve began to res increase interest rates in June, um, there's a little bit of a delay between when the investments mature and when we buy new investments at the higher rate. So now what we're seeing is we're going to start to see a little bit more elevated investment income due to those higher interest rates in the market. Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Benz. Just to clarify, that's a, that is a big jump. Uh, not a little bit more income, but quite a bit more income. About 100% more from last year. Well done. Well, well done, Federal Reserve, for boosting those rates. 
Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Benson, indeed. Yes, we, uh, the, the work that the investment committee had uh, completed in the first part of, or the first quarter of last calendar year um, helped us restructure some of that portfolio. And then so as with that, re that restructuring work, um, really put us in, a, in an advantageous position to take advantage of some of the Federal Reserve rate movements that they have been, been uh, completing, which is welcome. Madam Treasurer, do you have anything to, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> yes, as Ryan said, we had been talking to you over the past several quarters that we were over liquid. We are over liquid. We really didn't want to put a lot of our money in longer term savings or investments because the interest rates were so low. Uh, the economy wasn't there yet. So we kind of held on, not kind of, we did uh, have a lot of money in our highly liquid bucket. So uh, in looking at what was coming down the road uh, and how the Fed decided to continue to increase rates, uh, it was, we were really positioned well to take advantage of that. And uh, so you'll see um, even in the previous slides that uh, the deputy treasurer went over, you'll see more money in some of those accounts uh, and in those type of investments. And again, that was where we were moving money from the highly liquid to the liquid and to the core. Uh, so once you put it out into the core from zero to five years, you're going to gain more yield, uh, and you're gaining it very safely. Uh, and we, we were really pleased that uh, these numbers came out like this when we were looking at it in January. And I know GPA, our advisors, will talk more about that. But you're absolutely right. It was, it was perfect timing. You never want to time it. Uh, but we had set ourselves up well, which means our strategy was working. We stuck with the strategy. We we followed it through the first quarter of FY23, and now the second quarter, we're starting to see it pay off. And yeah, pays off pretty nicely. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Bravo, your I, mic is on. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. <clears throat> My question was just, I realized, even though I got this briefing earlier, that this may have also been the first time, I remember last meeting, we talked about um, expanding it to the four to five years before we had only had the three years. Is that also some of this impact or where does that, where have we seen impact from expanding out to four to five years when before we were just at up to three, right, for maturity? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Bobo, that's an excellent point. Yeah, so generally the longer the maturity, the higher yield you will pick up. So um, definitely extending that out from the, the three years to the five years helps pick that up incrementally. Um, the, our approach is to take that kind of cautiously step into those changes rather than just say, yeah, we're going to take, you know, put all of it, move all of it right at the same time. So, yeah, incrementally we'll start to see them <laughs> grow as well. And I think the the other uh, piece where this will that strategy will really shine is when rates are different, right? So the in rate environment now is... Um, it's atypical. It's not very often that the short short end of the curve has higher rates than the long end. And so when that we anticipate that to balance out, you look through the course of history, that balances out where longer-term rates are usually higher than short-term rates. So when that resets, that's where we're going to see a really big advantage to the, the strategy that we've been deploying. Can I ask a follow-up question? Mr. Chair. Oh. Commissioner uh, Barbara, Madam Chair. Thank you. So with the... Um, the, the current yield curve is inverted, as you're describing, and I think nine month is about as high as it gets, and then it starts to decrease in yield. So um, are you currently investing in the in the longer term uh, treasuries now, uh, even with uh, lower rates, just according to the strategy? Madam Chair and uh, Commissioner Benson, yes, we are. So if you go to that core detail that I just I just put up, you're seeing that we're starting to put into it. Um, but again, we are cautious uh, in that uh, we're, we're very picky at whether we're going out five years or two years. So it just all depends on what comes up on the Bloomberg machine that our investment advisors see on that day or the next day when they go to invest. Um, and I also just um, 
Madam Chair, just wanted to address Commissioner Barboa. Uh, you were right on with that because, yes, the investment policy you approved in August. So as of August is uh, when we stretched it out to those five years. So good memory. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Great. Thank you. Great discussion. And at this junction, I will turn it over to the county's investment advisor, um, government portfolio advisors. Um, Rashad, are you, uh, are you online? I am. Great, thanks. Take it away. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you to the board for having me. It's a pleasure to be in front of you again. And thank you to Madam Treasurer for having me as well. Um, uh, we're really excited about where the portfolio is and the current state of the structure. And that's what we've worked so hard to build over the last year. And we never chase yield. We never speculate on yield. And we never make investment decisions to kind of chase the current market. But we will take what the market's giving us. And being able to have a foundation and a framework for how to operate the portfolios allows us to navigate these cycles of uncertainty really, really effectively well. And it's coming out in your interest income. And it's going to keep coming out in that facet over the coming years. Um, if you want to jump to the slide deck, um, that would be great, and we can run so through I'm, it. I'm on the or, uh, compliance see. report now. I'm not sure if you can see what I'm seeing. I, I can't see what okay, you're seeing. Perfect. So um, I'm on the compliance report now. Okay, great. Um, one thing I do want to just, we would touch on this, but I wanted to address the questions really quickly uh, because I think they're really good questions for the current state of the market. Um, as we're deploying, uh, call it excess cash to some of the more uh, the core investment portfolio, we absolutely are adding across the spectrum of the zero to five year space. Um, as an example, uh, we made recent transactions um, across that space where we invested in the one year space at um, 511, I think. And we also invested in the four to five year space at about 410. Now, a, a good question is why are you investing at 410 when we can get 510 uh, in the near term? And it's really about that foundational portfolio structure of we want to hold securities and we want to own yield for multiple years for the county. And so uh, we're not just going to stick everything into short term in order to earn higher yield today uh, because it puts us at risk of the market changing and yields coming down, which we know they will um, you know, at some point here in the near future. So we want to take advantage of the short term where we can, which we're doing. Um, and I can go into that in more detail here in a couple of slides, uh, but we also want to anchor the portfolios in that three to five year space so that as rates come down over the coming years or whatever it is, you're still earning for a little over 4% or 4.5% in some of those securities. So it really is a, is a really good risk management tactic, uh, kind of keep uh, the investment earnings really stable and able to navigate business cycles. Now, the first thing we like to start off with is the compliance report. And as of December 31, kind of ending the calendar year Q4 here, uh, the county was in complete compliance with the investment with the investment policy, which is uh, you can see here in the first two slides. Um, as we go to the next slide, we wanted to do just a quarterly review. And these are just uh, key metrics that we look at on a summary level across each of those buckets that Deputy Treasurer talked about, the bond proceeds, highly liquid, the investment core, and then the laddered liquidity or the liquid. As it was referenced in, honestly, the yield reflects the current market and the ability to kind of add capital, especially as property taxes came in, whether it was short term um, or a bit longer term in the core, um, all within the established and approved strategy. So that's what's really exciting is um, all of the transactions that we're able to make is all within the approved strategy that we've talked about for several quarters now. And you know, we've seen that book yield increase almost 100 basis points on the total portfolio quarter over quarter. So uh, Deputy Treasurer said it better than, than anybody could. We're not here to chase markets. We're here to establish really sound foundational portfolio structure. And what it allows us to do is have very uh, swift and uh, kind of conservative decision making to take advantage of markets when we can. And, and that's what we've been able to do over the last quarter and what we're excited about. Uh, as we go forward in the year. We can jump to the next slide. Uh, this is just a recap of the existing strategies. And this is going back a full year, looking at 
three of the, the buckets here. First, the core investment portfolio. I know Madam Treasurer talked about a really methodical way of, of decreasing the highly liquid piece and adding to the core portfolio. Again, this will be the investment portfolio out zero to five years. Um, and we've, we've kind of deployed, you know, 135, a little more than that, 135 million acro across the year to that portfolio and increase the, the book yield um, uh, quite substantially. Uh, we actually added to the core portfolio, which I alluded to recently, another 20 million that was a weighted average about 4.8% uh, in book yield. So we're continuing to look to that. We like the strategy in that portfolio and it's, it's working really effectively to provide you a diversification from uh, not only the state pool, but other short-term investment options. And then as we look to the laddered liquidity, again, the, the purpose of this portfolio is to match known operating expenses for about a year's time. Uh, this was done at a really attractive uh, point in the market uh, from a yield perspective where uh, the initial deployment of that capital funding li uh, liabilities through October of 2023, the yields were between three and a half to uh, almost four and a half percent. Um, so that's been working really well. Maturities are coming due to fund payroll and debt service. Uh, the uh, the Treasurer's Department is, is doing a great job of tracking that, and we're in constant communication on kind of how well that is matching up and kind of if any excess funds need to be deployed uh, in shorter in the shorter term there. Now, that second bullet is a perfect example of being able to take advantage of existing portfolio structure um, without an established strategy, it's really hard to say, hey, we have excess capital that we want to invest, right? But we have a framework, we have a, a kind of an optimal decision tree that we work through uh, when there's opportunity to invest short term or longer term. And, you know, there was a period there with property tax receipts um, uh, before they were distributed to add a uh, very short term and pick up some sizable yield uh, on those on those funds, and we were able to do that within the ladder liquidity portfolio. So we were really happy to take advantage of that structure. And then the uh, I w one note uh, I like to add in some recent transactions. Uh, I know we're talking about quarter end, uh, but we did add um, a small amount to the ladder liquidity portfolio to fund expenses through November of 2023. That was about nine million at over five percent in yield. So you're kind of hitting. Again, I, I hate beating a dead horse. We're not chasing the market, but at the same time, like we're investing in some of the highest points of the yield curve. So going out to November uh, picked up about a little over 5% in yield there. And then the bond proceeds portfolio, we continue to, the objective of that portfolio is just to match expected cash flows. Um, we have invested a little over 3 million uh, since the last, uh, board meeting we had in, in November, and actually uh, we recently invested another 1.6 million. And um, you know, given the maturity structure of that, the yield was around 4.85% there too. So we can jump to the next slide, and we'll just review very briefly, or at a summary level, I won't say briefly, but at a summary level, the strategy and our recommendations for each of the buckets. If we look at the core investment portfolio. We're currently managing that portfolio to the zero to five year all treasury benchmark. That recommendation is going to is going to stay the same. We continue to see the zero to five year be an appropriate measure for the county from a risk profile perspective uh, and a, a kind of a duration and maturity ladder perspective. So what you can see in the table there is the current portfolio and the percent of the portfolio that's in each one of those um, called a mat a maturity or duration buckets. Um, it's pretty much on par with the target portfolio. We like to see about a quarter of the portfolio coming due under one year. That provides a really excellent buffer to the liquidity position uh, should those uh, maturities need to be used to buffer the highly liquid. Um, and then we're relatively well, well matched out to the five-year sector. So um, again, to reiterate an answer to a previous question, we continue to want to stay uh, pretty much neutral when it comes to duration. So right at two to 210 as it relates to the benchmark in the core portfolio. And then we definitely wanna uh, continue to add where it makes sense in the three to five year sector to really anchor in uh, what we're seeing in you know, 15, 20 year high yields uh, so that the county can own that yield over multiple years. 
And the, the second uh, recommendation for the core strategy is actually to add to the strategic asset allocation. So for a quick context, uh, we run a, a customized kind of optimization uh, for the county strategic asset allocation targets, uh, which is what you can see on the left and reflected in the grid below. Uh, the pie chart on the right is the current allocation of the core portfolio. Um, over the past couple quarters, we've recommended the strategic asset allocation target has been uh, kind of a combination of agencies, treasuries, and, munis and, and munis. We'd like to add supranationals to that strategic asset uh, allocation. Uh, supernaturals are securities that are already within your policy. Uh, they are AAA rated securities as well. Um, we conservatively want to target about 10% of the allocation uh, over time as kind of as we see opportunities in the market for those securities. So that's something we'd like to add uh, to our strategy as well. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to talk about that in more detail or add or, or go through any questions. Uh, on the right, you can see we're about 20, uh, about a quarter percent agencies in the core portfolio. Um, all of our recent additions have been in agencies. So I expect that allocation to continue to increase closer to our strategic target. The long story short of the overweighting in treasuries is that over the past year, uh, we really saw uh, supply dry up in the agency space um, and with rates where they were in treasuries and the supply of treasuries, it made the most sense to um, kind of take advantage of those securities uh, throughout the past year. But I would expect as we go into the next couple quarters that the agency allocation would get closer to the target. Now, if we shift to the liquidity laddered portfolio strategy, this is again a recommendation to maintain the existing strategy. Uh, we wanna allow maturities, this, the, the strategies to allow the maturities to go to cash to fund operating expenses for payroll and debt service. Uh, this portfolio is funded through November of 2023. Uh, and the idea would be that we would reevaluate at that time, uh, kind of when the larger revenues are coming into the county to refund that for another 12 months. So we wanna keep this portfolio under 12 months. We can also use this portfolio um, for short-term investments, uh, very similar to what we did uh, this past month with uh, property tax receipts kind of in that holding pattern before they were distributed. Uh, this is just a look at the maturities over the course of the next year for your reference. But again, these are, these are scheduled to match uh, operating expenses. And then from there, we look to go purchase the securities that are, that are going to maximize yield, but it's always after we've solved for uh, the maturity that's required from a cash flow perspective. And then if we jump to the next slide, the last is bond proceeds, a kind of a similar context around we're looking to match just expected cash flows. And, you know, we react uh, to the finance division and rely on that open form of communication to understand uh, where projects might be uh, and when reinvestment might make sense uh, for that particular portfolio. And then this, the last two are really just summary slides on a current look at the portfolio. Um, the way that we like to manage the, the balances as it pertains to each of the buckets is we really put strict guardrails around the minimum and maximum ranges in those buckets. Um, and this is all part of our disciplined portfolio uh, strategy, especially as we're adding or you know, moving funds, funds from one bucket to the other. Uh, along with our current duration targets. So uh, given the most recent additions, the operating core portfolio is closer to about 320 million. Uh, the liquidity laddered portfolio will continue to spend down as we mature those into cash to fund expenses. And then I think our highly liquid is um, closer to 100 million as of the current day. Um, so I think those targets, the targets are still uh, reasonable, and uh, we've you know been in discussion with uh, the treasurer's office as well about the minimum and maximum ranges, uh, as it per particularly as it pertains to the operating core portfolio. And I'm not sure if Deputy Treasurer, you had any additional commentary there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Rishad. Uh, yeah. So what I wanted to mention is after the the January. Let me back up. So we collect property taxes in December. 
send them out to the entities in January, the county's portion, the, uh, we retain that. So that amount that we've retained, um, we see opportunity to push that out into the core portfolio. Um, the liquidity ladder, it's matched all the way through the first half collection cycle of 2023, which will be November of this year. So we have some excess cash currently that if we were able to deploy to the core portfolio, we could then reinvest at that zero to five year range to earn a little bit more yield than we would if we just kept it in the highly liquid or the liquidity ladder portfolio. So um, we've kind of run through some cash flow analysis uh, within the la this past week, and we think a, a comfortable range there for the core portfolio would be either a, a minimum of 200,000 to a maximum of four or 200 million minimum to a maximum of 400 million. Um, so I was going to mention that to see if there was, you know, appetite to increase that 325 million maximum in the core uh, to 400, so we can take advantage of that. Or if you would prefer that we keep it there in the either highly liquid or liquidity laddered portfolio. Any comments, <clears throat> Commissioner Benson? Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. That is kind of a difficult uh, position because I, I see the the long-term strategy where we want to do that, but with yields um, so, so, you know, unusually high right now in less than a year, um, it's not encouraging to want to go ahead and pull the trigger to start moving uh, funds long-term, uh, especially once, once the yield curve writes itself. Uh, I think the long-term yields should be going up from where they are now. So, I'd, I'd say we hold off um, and maybe look at it again at our next meeting. Great. That, that's just my input. But, I mean, it's a tough call. It is, yeah. yeah I can make one additional comment as well. Um, I think it is a, it's certainly a difficult call. And, you know, if I could predict interest rates, you know, I think <laughs> probably be on a beach somewhere. But uh, <laughs> that that's not really what we're looking to do. I think primarily um, – you know, we, we definitely would see longer term rates increase. And but I think that could even be more in the seven plus year sector, which is not really where we're operating. Uh, currently, we'd be operating more in the three to five year space. And even though short term yields are higher uh, than those particular areas of the curve right now, I don't have the data in front of me. But historically, when you look at inverted yield curves, um, that two to five year space, even though it might be lower yielding today than maybe the zero to one year space, over multiple years, it's going to outperform uh, those shorter term securities in an inverted curve situation. And so what we want to do right now is we definitely do not want to um, kind of miss opportunities in investing in that sub 12 month space if we have excess cash. Um, that's partly what you're taking advantage of in the pool as well. Uh, but we, what we want to make sure we do is kind of anchor that portfolio in the three to five year space so that you're owning that yield for multiple years. Um, because the inverted curve is definitely telling us that rates are going to come down in the short end at some point um, over the next, <laughs> again, call it six months to two years, I would say. And so at that point, we want to be holding securities that are yielding in that four to four and a half percent range, I think. And you know, we really like, you know, how much we're anchored in the short end and the highly liquid uh, combined a little bit with the laddered liquidity. And so that's really the recommendation uh, where the recommendation comes from is kind of solving for it's more of a risk management technique of making sure we're anchored enough in that longer term space so that uh, we're not sitting on too much cash as rates come down. Thank you. And Madam Treasurer, I, I just want to keep us on time. We have five minutes before our administrative meeting starts at five o'clock. So uh, did you have any other additional comments? And Commissioner Benson had another comment first. Yeah, one last comment. You know, um, based on your comments also, uh, the with the yield so high in the short term, I think we probably could afford to move some of the funds uh, to the medium term and still benefit from these short-term rates. So, um, yeah, while I see the opportunity here, it's um, in terms of, you know, diversifying against the risk, um, it's probably a good move. Um, and, we, and I don't think we're going to hurt ourselves because I think in the next, I think rates are going to keep going up for the next uh, several meetings. So, um, which means we'll, our short-term will continue to benefit. 
meanwhile, we can start to grab hold of those two to five year. So given that, I think I'd be okay with it. Anything for Thank the you. treasurer? Uh, we had, I think, two more slides to go, but uh, they were, again, summary slides, just talking about recommendations to you um, <clears throat> that we've already mentioned in the previous slides with the core portfolio, uh, maintaining the benchmark, adding the Supras uh, to that, the bond proceeds, again, maintaining the existing strategy of matching expenses and reinvesting, and then the latter, again, is another maintain. So uh, we, we think the uh, strategy is, is working well, and, um, you know, we're good with it. The only other thing was the other office news that we had with our customer service survey uh, that turned out really great results for the treasurer's office with all customers that were coming in as being, you know, uh, exemplary actually and excellent mm -hmm. in the service they received. The quarter is always dedicated to tax collections for this first half. And then, of course, lastly, uh, besides Looking at the strategy, uh, this is the meeting where uh, the Board of Finance chooses a, a member to be on the investment committee for the rest of the calendar year. So that would wrap up my presentation. Thank you very much. I, I guess in terms of process, I, I want to move to give advice and consent to the proposed quarterly investment strategy as outlined uh, in the Board of Finance report. So do I have a second? Seconded by Second, Commissioner Madam Benson. And um, any discussion? Any further discussion? Um, and I guess the, uh, so I'll call for that vote and then we can talk about the appointment um, or does that need to be in this? Um, the um, naming of that individual does have to be at this meeting so it gets in the minutes uh, and is public information. Okay, I I'd like to nominate um, Commissioner Benson to continue um, doing an excellent job in that role. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank I accept. You. Great. Thank you. And uh, so with that, I can call for a vote for all of all of that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. And thank you, Deputy Treasurer. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair and members of the Board of Finance. It was good to see everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Um, lastly, I have an announcement of the next Board of Finance meeting will be held here Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023 at 4 p.m. And if there's no other business, this Board of Finance is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.